Let's do this. Self-publishing comics, it's hard. It's not easy at all. And if you have ever self-published a comic and gotten it out there in print, in people's hands, that's a huge accomplishment in and of itself. If that's something you've ever done, I give you credit for that. I'm saying that because I believe that the comic I'm about to review is maybe the worst comic book I've ever read. It's, it's printed on nice paper. Uh, the price point was originally $3.99 for a full-page, full-color comic on glossy paper. I think that for a self-published comic, that's, that's a pretty fair price. The overall idea, there's a, there's a kernel of a good idea here where an everyday average guy decides that he wants to battle terrorists. But let's just start going into this and... I'm going to come up with examples of, of where a, a self-published comic can go wrong. Like what I believe this does not do right, but we're going to list those problem areas that you can have when making a comic book. So without any further ado, it's time to review Civilian Justice. Being late to market. This comic book is time sensitive. It is very reactionary to the events of 9-11, and yet it came out in September of 2002. Now don't get me wrong, self-publishing takes time. It takes even a little bit more time than a mainstream publisher like Marvel or DC. But you have to think about, will my audience be looking for this kind of material in the time frame that I can get it out? Or should I look to try to create more evergreen content, something that's maybe a little more relatable and a little more timeless. Let's take a close look at this cover together. I find that this is very uninviting. First of all, the title, Civilian Justice, is in a silvery block lettering, but then it's sort of crowded out with text both above and below it. It's got a tagline, we do not attack, we defend, USA, that USA seems a little random, and then above it, it says a percent of profits will be donated to the relief funds. But all that text is, is overwhelming. It's intimidating. And we haven't even gotten to the art. Just that title, because sometimes all you can see is the top third on a comic book rack. Uh, it, it, it's not too inviting. It, it's, too, it's too much text. But let's really look at what it's trying to say. A percentage of profits. Doesn't say how much. Uh, anywhere. I've read this book cover to cover. I couldn't find either what percentage they're talking about donating or to which charity. Uh, I've also done some Google research. I can't find out if there was any amount of money donated to charity. Now maybe there was, but if you're going to put that as the first thing on the top of your cover, you better make damn sure that that is easy for people to check on. Otherwise, there are questions. Second, this tagline, we do not attack, we defend. And yet, the American superhero dressed in a flag seems to be the one attacking the terrorist who's on his back on the ground. Or is he on his back on the ground? They're both just sort of floating nebulously in space. Line work against a photo background generally doesn't look good. Uh, now, if you want to light box that so that it's sort of uh, still penciled and inked in your style, that can look okay. Uh, even if you have to resort to using a Photoshop filter to sort of, uh, you know, just, just make it look more like a, a photocopy or something, there's less of a dissonance. But this thing looks very, it looks extra cartoonish when the artwork is imposed over the background. And on top of that, they're not even standing on the ground. They're just sort of in midair with generic skyscrapers behind them. It doesn't look great. Uh, the anatomy on the hero is bloopy. Uh, if you look at his hips, those kind of look like ladies' hips. And if we look at the terrorist on the ground, he has even more problems. He seems to have some sort of a kilt thing, but I can't tell where his legs are. There's also a lack of detail in the sense that if you look at the terrorist's left hand, it only has four fingers. On top of that, 
I'm really not sure what's going on around his nose. It sort of looks like there's a rag covering just the nose, but then you can see his nostrils and there's holes in it. Maybe it's supposed to be snot? I'm, I'm not sure because that doesn't really follow the properties of clothing. There are no folds, there's just black circles here and there throughout it. I'm really not sure what this is supposed to represent, but it's kind of ugly. It's supposed to probably be empowering, isn't it? Having this American hero uh, in charge, in control, with the terrorist below. We open up on a two-page spread. That's kind of exciting. The hero is on his back. He's in trouble. A random terrorist is about to stab him. It's basically an inversion of the cover that we just saw. But while the general idea is strong, the execution itself is not very well done. Poor artwork is the main problem here. Specifically, the anatomy. Let's take a close look. The terrorist on the right-hand side just has strange musculature. His back is this gigantic bulge, but over on the other side, it ripples like bubbles. His head is pushed off to the side from center somehow. It doesn't quite match what we would expect in even a stylized version of a physique. Meanwhile, the hero on the bottom has all sorts of strange things going on as well. His chest is a big round bulge. His mouth seems to be wide open screaming, but covered in lots and lots of spittle. And then his eye is shaped almost like a lima bean. And that's not even getting into whatever is going on with the terrorist's nose. What is that thing? Is that part of a mask? Is it made out of hard plastic or something? Is it cloth? Is, is his face physically damaged? I really cannot tell what that thing across his nose is. We also have an issue with perspective. You're going to see these issues of anatomy and perspective repeated, and I just want to get it out of the way right up front so that I'm not harping on it as we look at the story. I think this is meant to be a two-point perspective background, but none of the lines are straight. It looks like the artist maybe didn't even use a ruler because the lines are very sketchy. I'm not saying that you always have to have every bit of artwork perfect. Uh, people have styles. And if you're going for something loose and impressionistic, that's fine. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to convey. But this is meant to be a realistic superhero story. And the artwork just takes us right out of it because it, it just does not make much sense. This bizarre artwork is making my head spin, so I might as well have a drink. The next page says that it's September 10th, which means it's before the attacks. We're obviously supposed to guess, intuit, that it is a flash forward, uh, which is not a great storytelling technique to use unless you have a great reason for it. If you have a way of pulling the rug out from under the reader because you're messing with their expectations, Great. If you're just trying to get right to action for no other point, not a great storytelling decision. At the Martinson House in New York City, we see two young men at the table talking with their father. The father is talking about how great some bulletproof armor that his blonde-haired son has, while the other son, he's trying to be cool with a leather jacket and a, a backwards baseball cap. He's putting his feet up on the table. Seems very disrespectful. And in fact, he is being disrespectful. He says, who cares about this? You die, you die. His father goes off on him and it's gonna be another trouble spot for the comic. What the hell's wrong with you? All these years ago, training and martial arts, learning the trade of becoming a detective like me, you're the only one in the family that didn't become a cop or fireman. Why, Clint, why? I taught you how to get whatever piece of information you wanted, and for what? So you could become a bum, wit ya stupid music, using everything I taught you to break into places and get into trouble. You'd be in jail or dead if it wasn't for me and my friends at the precinct. Those two word balloons give us three problem areas. Phony dialogue is the first. We've got what is an attempt at verisimilitude. He's trying to talk in a New York accent by saying things like duh instead of the, but it feels very forced. 
Uh, it doesn't feel realistic because it's just an exposition dump. It, this father is really just telling us everything we need to know about the character. And yet, the characters themselves would obviously know this information already, so it's not really the way a family would talk to each other. Bad lettering is a personal pet peeve of mine, and this is some of the worst lettering I've ever seen. Uh, it's distracting, which is the exact opposite of what good lettering in comics does. In a good comic, you often do not notice the lettering. You might notice some of the special effects techniques, but that's about the extent of it. Mostly, you want it to be almost invisible. You want to just flow through from point A to point B without any distractions. And yet, these word balloons are, first of all, semi-transparent, they're not centered very well. If you look at this first word balloon, for instance, the word amazing should be the first line, and then we cut down to the next line, just so that everything is spaced a little better. And you try to make the uh, balloon, in general, uh, a little more round, less oval. The tails are extra big, and they're not consistent. Sometimes they have a big curve, and on other pages, they're very angular. So there's no consistency. They italicize and bold the first letter in every sentence. It's tremendously distracting. And then on top of that, no one ever says and. Instead, there's always an ampersand. This isn't Twitter. You can use extra characters. And finally, we have a Mary Sue character. A Mary Sue character is a main character that is idealized, and often it's the author basically transparently inserting themselves into the story. And if you've seen what Greg Wyke, the writer and artist, looks like, I think it's pretty obvious that he tried to insert himself into this uh, main character of Clint. After the argument with his father, Clint goes to his apartment with his girlfriend, Sarah. Apparently that's in the village in New York, so they must be pulling in some fairly decent money. I mean, if we look at the actual art itself, this place looks pretty spacious. Beyond it making Clint somehow look cool, that he's got this perfect, beautiful girlfriend that says, I love you, I think you're fantastic for who you are. They, she literally says, they mean well, baby. They just don't understand you, that's all. Oh, that's all it is. He's perfect. People just don't understand him. It's not him that needs to change, it's others. But this page features some very bad inking. All of the pages do. But let's take a close look at exactly what I mean. This page is set in a bedroom at nighttime. So there should be a lot of thick black shadows. And while there are some shadows, they don't play in a natural or consistent way. There's a big shadow behind the two characters, yet Clint is not really casting much of any shadow on Sarah. There's no big shadows coming from the nightstand or from the pillows. When we look at the actual characters, any attempts at showing some dramatic lighting are done with coloring techniques. Uh, the characters' faces are not uh, shaded with thick blacks. Uh, this would be the perfect time to, to let an inker run wild and really add some depth and gravity to this page, but uh, that just doesn't happen. On top of that, there's very little variation of line width. What's in the foreground should probably be a thicker line to pull it out from the background. Uh, you should have some really fine, thin lines for things like hair, uh, stubble, uh, details like that, but every line seems to be the same width. It's very thick. And then, one of my least favorite things, the author feels the need to really outline Sarah's nipples. Look at these things. They're poking out like almost a full inch, and he outlines them all over the place, plus he has big stretchy lines taking place between the breasts. That's not really what breasts look like. On the next page, the story really gets started. Somehow we just cut to Clint in the heart of New York City downtown as the Twin Towers are attacked. We can see that the attack pretty much just happened, uh, and yet there's all this smoke and dust on the ground in the main panel. It disappears in the second following panel. I'll give the artist credit that the 
buildings look pretty good. The perspective there is well done. Also weird, look at this inset panel. I am assuming this woman is crying because of what's going on, but that's not how people cry. There are, there are just sort of random dots all over her face. That, that just doesn't look like crying to me. It also distracts tremendously from the main character's emotional reaction here, because she's in the foreground. That's what I noticed first. He seems to get hit by a wave of debris, but it doesn't really look like smoke to me. It looks more like some sort of strange pillow or a large piece of material that's draping itself across him and he's trying to push against it. I don't know where any of the other characters went. I guess Clint just stood in the middle of the street while everyone else wisely ran away and he just he just took the brunt of that force, but he's so tough that he survived. And he instantly finds a flag on the street. The flag itself is not damaged, and all the debris has politely placed itself around the flag, not on top of the flag. I guess his girlfriend Sarah must have been in the towers. Uh, we're never really told why she would be, like what her job is. He just drops to his knees and shouts, No! Except in the next page, Clint starts looking for his girlfriend, putting up missing posters everywhere. So maybe he was just shouting no at the disaster itself, and he's not sure if his girlfriend died or not. Uh, except he says, I knew, knew she was dead, I knew they were dead, all of them. The everyday people that went to work that day, the heroes who followed after them, and my Sarah, my reason for living, all dead. And then, this is unintentionally hilarious. Clint grabs a teenager's arm and screams at him. The teenager is wearing an anthrax band shirt, and Clint shouts, You think that's funny? You think bioterrorism is funny? Dude, they're just a retro metal band from the 80s. And then a basketball player picks up a microphone and yells at Clint for being a dick. From there, Clint just starts watching the news relentlessly. He's obsessed with what's happened. And here's the artist and writer's uh, attempt to show that not all Muslims are evil. He's got this dad with a cartoon baby toy in his arms, and seemingly he's on fire. And he's saying, please, we're Americans too, to a skinhead with some sort of a fishhook knife. It's an attempt to be fair. Meanwhile, Clint does some extreme sewing. You have never seen sewing this extreme, have you? I would totally read a comic about extreme sewing. That's something I've never read before. Anyway, Clint has taken that flag he found on the ground and sewn it into a mask. He's also put a message inside that says, if you find this mask, it means I did not survive. Please continue my work in the name of justice. And that's an interesting uh, sort of pulp hero uh, trope. Uh, there were characters like the Phantom who were legacy heroes. Each Phantom would train a new person to be the Phantom and take his place. Here's civilian justice in all his glory. He's basically wearing some sort of custom motorcycle leather combined with BDSM gear. Lots of buttons and straps. And he's going to carry the flag around with him. I guess the flag he found on the ground is the one that he turned into a mask, and then he just bought another one to carry around with him. You know, fair enough. But have you ever tried to look through a flag? Not just through something sheer, but an actual flag? It's not very easy. I think civilian justice is going to have a lot of adventures just involving getting down the stairs. I'm also going to mention bad coloring. Unfortunately, uh, the coloring in this comic is, is not very good. Uh, I think we can charitably say that. The foreground and background often have very similar colors, which makes it hard to pull out what's in the foreground from the background or the middle ground. Also, there's a lot of sort of Photoshop effects added. Sometimes it's something like a lens flare, and in this case, it's some sort of a halo all the way around him. The next couple of pages, the coloring is even darker. It's very hard to understand what's going on. The NYPD 24th Precinct is apparently empty at night. 
Civilian Justice just smashes his way into his dad's computer, gets some information on a suspect that has ties to terrorists. He puts his arm on that guy's shoulder later on, and there is dialogue saying that he instantly gave up his contact. Civilian Justice is hiding in the trees at the suspect's house, and uh, there's police and FBI hanging out outside. Civilian Justice seems to have some sort of listening device, but at the same time, I don't know why he's listening to them, because it looks like the FBI has found a scrap of an American flag, which seems to imply that Civilian Justice has already been there, and then is just waiting? And then, I'm not even sure if it is a listening device, because in the next panel, it actually looks like a fan. Civilian Justice sneaks into a house where some sort of terrorist suspect is waiting with a machete. He does a punch with his fist, which seems to break the terrorist's hand right off. And then he does some sort of a ballerina type of kick. I'm not quite clear on what that is. But now the guy is unconscious and has blood everywhere. From there, Civilian Justice picks up his flag, which he didn't have in the previous panels, so maybe he ran back outside and brought in his flag to show to the knocked out terrorist, and he says, the scent of vengeance is so pungent in my nose, the taste so strong on the tip of my tongue, it transformed me into a weapon of well-focused force. Remember, Simon says, now it's time to play. Justice says, I like my game better. His game, apparently, is he uses the American flag to wrap the terrorist up. I don't think an American flag is the most efficient bondage gear. Maybe he could take one of the many, many straps off of his thighs to tie the guy to his chair. That might work a little better. And then Civilian Justice punches the guy some more. Tries to crawl out of a window that he obviously cannot fit out of. Uh, but in the next panel, he's running away from the house, so maybe he found a bigger window. I'm not sure exactly what these terrorists' plans are. We have not heard any of them say what they're planning on attacking or when. So there are, there are really no stakes. There's just this vague sense that there are many terrorists already here in America. Uh, but what's their plan? It doesn't say. So there's no real reason to get worked up. We just know that they're around, and apparently civilian justice is plenty capable of sneaking behind them and beating them up, which is exactly what he does here. He knocks out two guys between two panels. One of the guys has a purple headband and eyes that are bugging out in just such a creepy way. Anyway, uh, the next terrorist he encounters shoots at him, smart, but civilian justice blocks the bullets with his flag. The whole point of this, I thought, was that anyone could be civilian justice. Remember, he printed that note in his mask that says, if you found this, I'm dead, that means that you're civilian justice now. I don't know about you, but if I had a flag, I could not block bullets with it. That's not something that I could do. In the next panel, there are now two more terrorists. There's no sense on where anybody is in relation to anything else. Which rooms are important or what's in the room. People just appear and disappear. So civilian justice is in the middle here. He's pointing at some sort of leader, I guess, and dropping like a shard of glass or something into his shoulder. But the bad guy isn't reacting to that. That aforementioned terrorist that we saw on the cover and the flash forward with the one with the confusing nose, he's running up behind civilian justice with a baseball bat. He hits civilian justice in the back. I guess that that force was so strong that it causes civilian justice's mask to burst open. I'd complain about the physics of that, but we did just see him deflect bullets with an American flag, so, you know, if a bat to the back makes a mask blow open, so be it. Now we're caught up to where we started. Uh, the terrorist is about to impale civilian justice with his own flag. In fact, he says, how ironic, to die by the very thing you believe in, to die by my justice. Meanwhile, there's an inset of civilian justice's eye covered in urine, apparently. 
But then when we flip the page, we've got a two-page spread, and civilian justice has somehow reclaimed the flag and is stabbing the terrorist right through the chest. It feels like we missed a few panels, right? I mean, in one, he's on the ground, no weapon in hand. In the next, he, civilian justice now has the flag and is impaling the terrorist. How did that happen? I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Again, the anatomy is bizarre. Look at this terrorist. We can see the back of his shoe, we see his butt, and yet we also see his entire chest and face. Good luck twisting your spine 180 degrees. I don't think civilian justice needed to impale him. This guy was dead just by reacting in fear. He snapped his own spine. Civilian justice bundles up his flag, which is just covered in blood, of course, and he says, uh, now your fate rests with the feds. Uh, pretty sure he has no fate if you've put a pole right through his chest. The female FBI agent from earlier bursts in and tells civilian justice to freeze. Then she says, give me your gun. And he says, don't have one, not my style. Then he throws his flag right at the FBI agent's face. It looks like it misses her by a millimeter or maybe even scrapes her cheek. She screams in terror, as you would. Uh, but there was a terrorist behind her. He was just saving her life. But then in the next panel, he's throwing the flag again. This might be some of the most confusing storytelling in this entire issue. Now, I mentioned how uh, there are some confusing things happening from panel to panel. That's what I mean by storytelling. A good artist makes it very clear what's happening from one panel to the next. It's not that you have to show everything that takes place, but it should be very obvious what's taking place. It's not very obvious what's taking place in these three panels, because here's what we see. Civilian justice throws the flag backhand style. The flag lands in a terrorist chest. But then in the next panel, civilian justice is now throwing it forward. First he threw it backwards, now he threw it forwards. But there's only one flag. So it's, it's very confusing. Because he saved her life, the FBI agents let civilian justice run away. Uh, and don't worry, uh, we can still see the FBI agents' nipples outlined very clearly. So that's civilian justice. That took a lot out of me looking at this thing. Look, self-publishing, making your own comics, it's not easy. So the fact that this was published is, on one level, impressive. Uh, but I think you really need to think to yourself, if I'm going to invest the resources to, to print something, to market it, even just to create it, uh, what's worth my time? Uh, I would say that this guy had a kernel of a good idea that was hamstrung by the actual execution. The dialogue is just awful. Uh, the technical details like lettering and coloring uh, and inking just, just ruin it. It makes it almost unreadable. It, it's very, very confusing page to page. I had to read through this multiple times to make sense of it uh, for this review. It, it's not an easy read. Uh, and of course the artwork is, you know, it, it, it's getting there, but it's, it's not very good. The anatomy is so problematic. The, the perspective is often completely out of whack. Uh, it, it's just not appealing to the eye. And it's an ugly story. You know, this guy is basically perfect. He just goes around brutalizing people he has no real problems. Uh, we don't even know for sure that his girlfriend died. You know, he, he's got some doubt himself, so he has no significant problems. He's just decided to be a vigilante and go out and beat people up because he's perfect at martial arts and detective work. There's no stakes. We don't know what the terrorists want. It's, it's a poor idea made even uglier by the fact that it's tied so realistically into the 9-11 attacks. Seeing that actual explosion in the last few pages is very upsetting and depressing. You know, it's, it's just depressing more than anything else. Anyway, I do not recommend this issue, obviously, uh, but even if I did, you know, good luck finding it. it I, I've never seen a copy in a store. I bought it for one penny on Amazon, uh, not Amazon, eBay, 
back in 2004. So, you know, maybe there's copies out there. I don't know. Uh, it's pretty obscure. Uh, I feel a little bad, you know, just mentioning all the problems, but if we acknowledge problems that can occur in books, uh, that's how we can hopefully avoid some of those same pitfalls. Anyway, I appreciate you joining me. Uh, trust me, we've got some really fun, crazy, fun, goofy, wild comics coming up to review and discuss. So until next week, keep reading comics.